Hi, my name is Laura, and welcome to my podcast, Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with their movie adaptations, and through these discussions, you will hear why, nine times out of ten, the book wins. I'll also share different behind-the-scenes trivia I've discovered in my research, which by learning makes the story all the more interesting. If you love either books, movies, or both, this is the perfect podcast for you. This probably already goes without saying, but there will be spoilers for both the book and the movie in this podcast. So if you plan on reading the book or watching the movie, go do that first and then come back and listen to this. And now without further ado, let's get right into it. Hi, welcome back to the podcast. Today I'm going to be talking about 12 Years a Slave, which is a memoir written by Solomon Northrup, published in 1853, and then they made a movie of it, which was released in 2013. So a quick synopsis, we have Solomon Northrup, who was born a free man in the state of New York, and he has a wife and kids, and then in 1841, he takes a job playing the violin for this traveling circus with these two guys. He travels down with them to Washington, and There he gets drugged, kidnapped, and sold into slavery and taken down to Louisiana. He spends the next 12 years as a slave, during which time he has three owners, William Ford, John Tibbetts, and Edwin Epps. And through this time, he also is, like his owners will loan him him out to other people. So he has a few experiences with different men. He also plays the violin, and that is known. And so people will also hire him out to play the violin at parties and such. Uh, His last owner was Edwin Epps, and he was with him for the majority of the time. He worked there, or not worked there, but he was there for 10 years. And this was also the worst owner. Uh, He was very mean and spiteful, and he was a drunkard. Uh, And then in 1852, a Canadian is helping Epps on this project, and Northrop overhears them talking. The Canadian Bass is talking about how slavery should be illegal and how it's not right. And after hearing him talk like this for a few days... Solomon feels like it's safe that he can confide in him that he's actually a free man. And with Bass's help, uh, he writes a letter up north. And then thanks to that letter, people who had known Solomon come down to Louisiana and they save him and bring him back up north. And then that same year, he was rescued in January of 1853. And then later that year, he published his memoir, memoir, 12 Years a Slave, telling his story. The movie follows the book really closely. They took out a few scenes and made some minor changes here and there, but overall it is a really faithful adaptation. The book is hard to read at times, but the movie is definitely very hard to watch. Uh, You know, it's one thing to read, you know, they whipped me so much I thought I would die. And then, as horrible as that is, it's just another to see it realistically being portrayed on screen. And I actually fast-forwarded through some of the harder scenes and that kind of seems to be a trademark of the director of this movie Steve McQueen and he's only released three full-length movies the first two are like almost even more difficult and uncomfortable to watch than this one just more yeah more uncomfortable I guess in an interview he says how he's actually a happy person and he doesn't know why his movies end up being kind of dark and it's not something he does purposefully but it's just kind of what happens and he says how when you're an artist you don't always get to choose where your art takes you so I just thought that was interesting I had seen this movie before I saw it in later in 2013 when it had come out on DVD and I actually only remembered bits and pieces the main thing that I remembered was just the heaviness of it with the acting I have no complaints at all everyone even the smaller roles did an amazing job and the movie really pulls you in the cinematography is also really beautiful and powerful. And so thanks, you know, to acting, the script, the directing, uh, it just really, like I said, it just really pulls you in. So the actor who played Solomon, I'm probably going to say is wrong, but his name wrong, but it's uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor. Uh, he did a great job playing Solomon. And whether it's a scene with no dialogue where he's just expressing in his face or scenes where he is talking. Either way, he just does a really powerful job. Michael Fassbender plays Edwin Epps, and Fassbender is actually one of my favorite actors. He's like always amazing no matter what he's in, whether he's playing a good guy or a bad guy or a robot. He always does an amazing job. And whenever I watch a movie with him, it makes me just want to go on a Fassbender binge and watch all his movies because he's 
you just get so caught up in his performance and you forget he's even acting because he's just so realistic and as I said he plays Edwin Epps in this and he plays a terrible person but he does a great job playing that terrible person then we have uh I'm probably gonna mess up her last name but Lupita Nyong'o and she's incredible she plays Patsy and this was actually her first feature film she had minor roles and like TV shows and different things. So this was her first big role and she won an Academy Award for it. Uh, and since then, she's become a fairly well-known actress and has been in quite a few major movies. So that's cool. And then we have Paul Dano, who plays John Tibbetts. And his character is also terrible, but he does a great job. Uh, he is an amazing actor too. And I think he's so underrated. Every movie, which I haven't seen a I haven't seen all of his movies, but every movie of his I have seen, he just does such a great job. And at some point, I'll be reading Oil, which is the book adaptation, or which is the book of the movie, There Will Be Blood, which stars Paul Dano. So I'm excited to read that one and then watch the movie again and just get to see his acting. Uh, And then we have Benedict Cumberbatch, who plays William Ford. His role was much bigger in the movie as or sorry, his role was bigger in the book, as was Paul Dano, John, who plays John Tibbetts. Tibbetts and Ford were bigger roles in the book, and they made them smaller in the movie. But Benedict Cumberbatch does a good job, no complaints. Sarah Paulson plays Mrs. Epps, and she does a good job playing this vengeful character. And she got the role because when watching the audition tapes, Steve McQueen's daughter saw hers, and he And she said he should pick her because she was scary. (laughs) And I definitely agree. She does a good job. And last but not least, we have Brad Pitt, who plays a very brief role. He's in it for, I don't know, 10 minutes. And he plays Bass. And he does a good job. His production company helped produce this movie. And some people insulted him being like, oh, you take on this small role playing the hero. But he said that it was easier to get the film produced if he was in it. And so he claims that's why he took on this role. But he didn't want to be a major part of the story, so he took on a smaller role of Bass. So the differences we have, one small difference is that in the book, or in real life, the book is real life, Solomon had three kids. He had two daughters, one son. In the movie, they give him one son, one daughter. So minor difference. Which, speaking of his family in the movie, in the early stages of his enslavement, they show a flashback to him with his wife and kids in New York and then back to current times with him being a slave. And that was a really good scene. You know, it just shows the contrast between his life as a free man and his life as a slave. And then when they're on the boat, taking him to New Orleans, he's with two other men and the three of them plan an escape. And in the book, the escape doesn't happen because one of the men gets smallpox and he dies. And in the movie, they made it a bit more dramatic because they had it where the man sees a sailor like trying to take a girl to take advantage of her and the guy stops him. And so the sailor stabs him and that's how he dies. So in the book, he got smallpox and got sick and died. But in the movie, they made it a bit more dramatic by having it that way. And then another change, which again is a smaller change, but one of the other guys, Clemens, when they get to New Orleans, his owner is there because he was wrongfully put up for sale or something. And so his owner is there and he calls him out for him and comes, takes him back. And Clemens is really happy and relieved because I guess he had a kind owner. And Solomon says how it was a tender scene to watch, to see him being saved from being put up for sale. But how he himself felt disheartened that no one was there for him. And so he says that it was a tender scene, even though he felt sad. But in the movie, he like is yelling out Clemens' name and is, you know, really distraught, visibly distraught over the fact that he's being left alone now. Another small difference is when they go up for sale at New Orleans, he's with a woman named Eliza and her two children, a boy and a girl. And in the book, her son is sold the day prior, I believe. And she, you know, she didn't want her son to be taken from her. Uh, but the guy buys her. And then, you know, the next day or a few days later, Ford comes and he buys Eliza. She asks him to buy her daughter too because she's already been separated from her son and she can't bear to be separated from both children. 
And in both the book and the movie, Ford offers, he's like, okay, how much for the daughter too, so I can get them both. And the slave trader refuses to sell the daughter because he says that, you know, she's so pretty. And in a few years, he can make way more money on her. So he's not going to sell her. But in the movie, they had the son was still there the same day as Eliza was sold. So that's a minor change. And speaking of Eliza, in both the book and the movie, after she's sold and separated from her kids, she's inconsolable. And Solomon talks to, talks to her in the book and tries to get her to feel better. But they never argue, whereas in the movie, he gets mad and he yells at her that he needs to stop crying, and they get into a little argument, sort of. But that never happened in the book. And also in the movie, Ford's wife, he gets, she gets tired of hearing Eliza crying, and so she sells her. At least that's what it makes it seem, like it shows her being taken away. Whereas in the book, Ford's wife was actually, Ford and his wife were both kind, and she tried to comfort Eliza, and Ford even told her that he was going to have her work inside the house, and they would take it easy on her while, you know, she's mourning. But eventually, though, she is she is crying too much in the book, and so Mrs. Ford has her taken out to work outside instead, and that's where she stays. And eventually, she does die because she just doesn't have the will to live anymore. Whereas in the movie, Mrs. Ford was much harsher and when she sees Eliza crying rather than comforting her, comforting her, she's just like, oh, don't worry, you know, before long, you'll totally forget about your kids. And then, like I said, they show her eventually selling her, it seems. They also make Ford less likable in the movie than he was in the book. Uh, in the book, Solomon actually had a good experience with him, as good experience as you can being someone's slave. And one of the biggest changes is in the movie, Solomon tells Ford that he's a free man who has been kidnapped and Ford at the time had already sold him. And so he says how, you know, he's like, don't tell me this. There's nothing I can do about it right now. And in the book that never happened, Solomon was too scared to admit to someone that he was actually a free man because he does in the beginning and he gets whipped really bad for saying that. And so another slave warns him like, don't tell anybody that because you'll just end up dying. And so he's really nervous who he confides into, confides in. And so he doesn't tell Ford, and later on he actually regrets it, and he wishes that he would have because he thinks Ford would have helped him. So that was a big change, because in the movie that scene makes Ford very unlikable, but that actually never happened. And another thing with Ford, a likable thing they did in the movie, was that he gives Solomon the violin, which he plays. And in the book, I don't think Ford gave him a violin, because Solomon has a violin, because he will play it for people and he gets paid to go play at parties and stuff but I don't know where he got the violin at I don't think Ford gave it to him but I also am not entirely sure where he gets it from in the book and then later we meet Tibbets who works for Ford as a carpenter and in the book Ford eventually has to give Solomon to Tibbets because Ford goes into debt and he has no other way to pay Tibbets and so he gives him Solomon in the movie though Tibbets never actually officially owns Solomon he just interacts with him because he's Ford's carpenter. And in the movie, it shows one time where Tibbetts tries to kill Solomon, but in the book, it was actually twice. And the one time, which the movie doesn't show, is Solomon is applying the planks onto the house, which they do show this scene where Tibbetts comes up saying he's not doing it right, even though Solomon is doing it right. And so in the movie, that doesn't really lead to anything or so in the movie they kind of combined the two fights into one but so in the book he's applying the boards and Tibbets complains about it and he has a hatchet and then he comes at Solomon carrying this hatchet and so Solomon is able to grab him and he takes the hatchet and tosses it out of reach and he actually you know overpowers Tibbets and actually could have killed him but he doesn't and instead he just runs away and he runs into the swamps and he is there for like two days and a night making his way back to Ford's house Ford's plantation. And once he gets there, he tells Ford what happened. And Ford, you know, gives him food and lets him sleep. And he lets him stay there for four days, kind of giving Tibbets time to cool off. And then eventually they take him back to Tibbets' place. And Ford suggests that Tibbets sell him or loan him out or something because clearly, you know, he hates Solomon and he's probably just going to end up killing him. So he just sell him and not have him anymore. And so that's when Tibbets sells him to Epps, 
which again in the movie Tibbets never owns him and so it's Ford that sells him to Epps and in the movie Ford knows that Epps is a cruel slave owner but he's like but I have no other options I would like to think I mean he was still a slave owner meaning Ford but for a slave owner he was kind and he treated them well and actually got to know them and so I would like to think that he wouldn't have sold anyone to Epps knowing how bad he was but in the movie he does Anyway, in the book, it's Tibbetts who sells him to Epps. In the movie, once he's sold to Epps, we see a scene where uh, Edwin Epps is reading the scriptures to them on a Sunday, but he's reading it in a way that's like he's reading a verse showing how that verse is talking about how slaves should obey their masters. In the book, Edwin Epps never reads them scriptures and doesn't really talk about God. In the book, this does happen, though, where a guy is reading them scriptures and that was actually by a guy that he works for when he's when Tibbets loans him out to someone. So he loans him out to this guy named Peter Tanner. And Tanner is reading scriptures in this way that's making it seem like the scriptures are pro-slavery. Ford, it shows Ford reading scriptures to them in the movie. And in the book, Ford would read them. But he, it makes it seem like he didn't read it in, I don't know, such a condescending way as Peter Tanner did. But aside from the religious aspect, they do do a good job portraying Epps accurately. Mrs. Epps is a cruel woman, and her harsh feelings, though, are generally reserved for Patsy, who she is very jealous for, jealous of. And this is because Epps will take advantage of Patsy, and Mrs. Epps is aware of this. And so Patsy just has it bad because she gets the negative attention from both the Mr. and the Mrs. And in the book, though, it says how Solomon thought that Mrs. Epps had some good qualities. And had she not been in this, had she not been in this situation with her husband, with Edwin Epps, had she not married him, that she could have been a decent person. But in the movie, she doesn't have any positive qualities at all, really. In the book, she actually talks to Solomon and converses with him. And when he's taken away, she even cries and I mean, she still wasn't a good person, but she sh- showed some emotion crying, whatever that means. Who knows why she was crying, but anyhow. Um, another change with Patsy is that in the movie, Mrs. Epps will try to get Edwin Epps to whip Patsy more because she's angry at Patsy and so she wants him to punish her. And in the movie, he only does that once and it makes it seem like it's a big deal that he's doing it that one time. Whereas in the book, he would often whip her and uh, the wife would make him, would convince him to do it. And then he would do it and he didn't seem to have a problem. So he was just a really wicked person. Whereas in the movie, he only does it the one time. This time is in the book and the movie where it's a really bad whipping. And he actually has Solomon start doing it. And then Solomon stops and he refuses to do it anymore. And so Epps takes over. Another change with Patsy was that they added a scene, the scene where she asks Solomon to kill her because she can't do it herself. And from when I watched this in 2013, this was the scene that I still remembered and that stuck out the most because it's just Lupita Nyong'o just gives such a heartbreaking performance and it's hard to forget. But that actually didn't happen in the book, though. She never asked Solomon to do that. And Solomon actually says that Patsy had a cheerful disposition despite her situation and it wasn't until after that really bad whipping that starts out with Solomon and then Epps take over it wasn't until that whipping that really broke her spirit and after that she was just always downcast and the book it's obviously through Solomon's perspective it's his memoir so it never shows things that he himself didn't witness firsthand and in the movie it also does this except for one scene and that's a scene with Epps taking advantage of Patsy. There isn't any nudity, but it's still, of course, an uncomfortable scene to watch. And I personally think it could have been left out. I think there's ways that it could have been, you know, shown or represented what was happening without actually showing it. And I feel like a lot of people think that it's more powerful to actually show you this, you know, disturbing thing that's happening. But I feel like there's ways that it can be alluded to or shown in some way without directly showing it that can still be equally powerful personally anyway and then near the end we meet bass who saved solomon by writing him a letter 
by writing a letter for him to the people up north. And in the book, he and Solomon meet at night in the woods because it's not safe for them to be seen talking to each other in broad daylight. But in the movie, they talk to each other in broad daylight. They meet up a number of times and actually really get to know each other. And Solomon gives him Solomon gives him lots of names of people he had known and where they lived. And Bass, who is getting on in age, vows that he will help Solomon gain his freedom, even if, you know, before he dies, he's going to make sure Solomon gains his freedom. And in the movie, the guy who comes down from the north to get Solomon is this guy named Parker, who owned a store. But in the book, it was a guy named Northrup, which Solomon's last name is Northrup. And this guy, Northrup, had owned his dad as a slave, and then he freed Solomon's dad. So Solomon was therefore born a free man, and they stayed friends with this Northrup family. So it's this man that comes down to Louisiana and rescues Solomon. And in the movie, this scene, it happens really fast. They go down there. They ask Solomon a few questions. Epps walks up and asks what's going on, and uh, and they take Solomon away. But in the book, it didn't go quite so fast. They asked Solomon some questions to make sure it was him. And then they went to go see Epps, who was inside the house, and they discussed things with him. And while talking to him, this gave Solomon time to... You know, the other slaves left the fields because they wondered what was going on. So they were all coming up asking him what was happening and and they were happy for him. So some of the scenes that weren't included in the movie that were in the book, I mentioned some above, but some others were that Solomon, out of the 10 years he worked with Epps, eight of those years, he was the overseer. And overseers on the Epps plantation are expected to whip the slaves regularly. And Solomon says how he got really good at pantomiming the whip so it actually wouldn't touch the people. But they would act as if they were getting whipped and cry out. And when Epps was walking by, they would... So when he's sold into slavery, he they just take away his name Solomon and they call, call him Platt. So he's known as Platt during all 12 years. Anyway, so as Epps is walking by, they would complain how Platt whips them too much and they would say it just loud enough that Epps would be able to hear. Also in the book, Solomon's family had known that he was sold into slavery because of the guy Clemens who had been on the boat with him. He had told Clemens his story and then Clemens was saved and he got word back up to his family. So they knew he was alive and that he was a slave or they hoped he would he was still alive. But it was imp- like impossible to find him because they didn't know where he was. They didn't know he was going by the name Platt. So they knew what was going on and they hoped he was still alive, but there wasn't much they could do. Another part they left out was that during Christmas, this was the only time of year that slaves were given days off. On Epps plantation, he gave them three days off, but other owners would give them like as much as six days off. And this was the happiest time of the year and they all looked forward to it. And they would gather together with slaves from other plantations and eat and dance. And it was when a lot of weddings would take place. And so it was a really the only happy time in their lives basically and I wish they would have shown this in the book I think it would have been good to see them enjoying themselves to some extent uh, and maybe lightened up the movie a bit more by having that but I feel like the movie by leaving that out they just made it heavier than it already was kind of and there's another section in this book that I thought was really interesting uh, and it but it isn't really shown in the movie Solomon he says that a lot of the white people in the South, how they had a lower regard for human life in general. And here's a quote from the book where he says, every man carries his Bowie knife, and he's talking about white men. So every white man carries his Bowie knife, and when two fall out, they set to work hacking and thrusting at each other more like savages than civilized enlightened beings. The existence of slavery in its most cool in its most cruel form has a tendency to brutalize the humane and finer feelings of their nature. Daily witnesses of human suffering, listening to the agonizing screeches of the slave, beholding him writhing beneath the merciless lash, bitten and torn by dogs, dying without attention, and bearing without shroud or coffin, it cannot otherwise be expected than that they should become brutified and reckless of human life. So it's just interesting insight that I'd never thought before how viewing slaves being abused and tortured this way it caused them to just care less about human life in general, so it really desensitized them. So after publishing his memoir, he 
with Topeka Conventions supporting the abolitionist movement. And part of his book was also included in The Key to Uncle Top's Cabin, which the book Uncle Top's Cabin, written by Harriet Beecher Stowe, is an anti-slavery novel written in 1850. And when it was published, it, there was a lot of criticism from the Southerners saying that she was exaggerating and making slavery seem worse than it really was. And so then a few years later, she released The Key, the key, to, Uncle Tom's, the key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, subtitled, presenting the original facts and documents upon which the story is founded, together with corro- corroborative statements verifying the truth of the work. So it's basically the second short book she released, giving evidence to what she said. And part of his story was included in that. And about five years after his memoir was published, Solomon just kind of disappeared from history. And in 1858, there was a newspaper publicizing that he was kidnapped and taken back into slavery again but he would have been like 50 years old so that wouldn't have really made sense to do plus just a couple years later then the civil war happened so no one knows what happened to him or how or when he died and so it's just kind of strange that we just don't know in the end whether I like the book or movie more I would say I liked the book the movie is also really good and like I said it stays true to it and but I think the book even though He doesn't shy away from expressing how horrible things were. He also is just not as hard to watch visually, like I said. So for that reason, I I could see myself reading the book a bit again, but I don't see myself watching the movie anytime too soon. But I think it's good to read books like this, and I think everyone should read this book. I think by reading about these horrible things that have happened, whether it's slavery or the Holocaust or even the sufferings of someone someone's individual sufferings I think it's good to read those things because by doing so it gives us more sympathy for those around us and a better appreciation for life in general so I guess that's the last of my thoughts on 12 years a slave it's a heavier topic than some of my previous ones but I hope you guys like it and I'll see you next time Thanks for listening. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, head over to my site, whythebookwins.com. You can leave a comment there and I will be sure to reply. You can also find me on Instagram under the same name, whythebookwins, and you can message me there and don't forget to follow. And also don't forget to subscribe to my podcast and join me next Wednesday for the newest episode of Why the Book Wins. Why the Book Wins.